After initially welcoming Christopher Columbus and his crew to Jamaica and supplying them with food and supplies after he became shipwrecked in 1503, the Arawak Indians grew weary of Columbus's men robbing and cheating them and subsequently halted all trade with their island guests. Without a significant source of food or means to leave, Columbus's expedition was in serious trouble. Lucky for his crew, he had certain astronomical tables with him, including the ephemeris compiled by the German astronomer Regiomantinus. In this almanac, it was predicted there would be a total lunar eclipse on March 1st, 1504, for Columbus beginning on February 29th, 1504 in the Americas. He also gave an estimation of what time it would occur, though this start time was based on Nuremberg, Germany time, so Columbus had to do a bit of guesstimating. Importantly, a fairly accurate time on how long the eclipse would last was also included. Armed with this knowledge, which Columbus was choosing to gamble would be extremely accurate, he called a meeting with the chiefs of the nearby tribes shortly before the eclipse was to take place. In this meeting, he told them his god was angry with him for ceasing to give him supplies. As a result, his god would take away the moon as a sign of his anger and subsequently punish them for their actions. Lucky for Columbus, the predicted lunar eclipse took place more or less on schedule and, according to Columbus's son, Ferdinand, who was 13 and had made the voyage with his father, the Indians observed this eclipse and were so astonished and frightened that with great howling and lamentation they came running from every direction to the ships laden with provisions, praying the admiral to intercede by all means with God on their behalf, that he might not visit his wrath upon them, and promising they would diligently supply all their needs in the future. Columbus agreed to take their case before his god and went into his cabin to pray. What he actually did in there was watch an hourglass and use the time to attempt to calculate his longitude, which the lunar eclipse facilitated, though he would inexplicably be wildly incorrect on the figure he came up with. In any event, Columbus knew the moon would stay completely in the Earth's shadow for around 48 minutes. Shortly before it would begin to emerge, he came back out and told the natives he had asked his god to forgive them, and god had acquiesced so long as the natives continued to cooperate with him. The moon began to reappear, and Columbus no longer had trouble getting the provisions he needed. He and his crew were picked up a few months later when a ship from Hispaniola arrived in Jamaica on June 29, 1504. On June 30th, 1973, a combined team of British, American, and French astronomers were able to experience the longest total eclipse in the history of humanity by chasing the shadow of the moon across the Sahara Desert in an, at the time, prototype Concorde aircraft. The proposal for doing this was rejected by the British Aircraft Corporation but got the green light from the French after astronomer Pierre Lena appealed directly to French test pilot André Turcotte. Turcotte in turn convinced the higher-ups on the French side of the plane's development to allow it. While flying under the shadow of the moon, the Concorde, which was modified with viewing portholes on the roof to facilitate the needed observation, maintained a speed of approximately Mach 2.05, about 1,572 miles per hour, or 2,531 kilometers per hour, and an altitude of about an average of 56,000 feet, or 17,000 meters. This allowed the astronomers to study the various associated phenomenon of totality for an astounding 74 minutes, which is approximately 10 and a half times longer than one could maximally observe the eclipse on the ground, at 7 minutes and 4 seconds in a region of the Sahara Desert. That latter figure, by the way, is only 28 seconds shy of the longest possible totality for any eclipse observed from the ground. A solar eclipse on May 28, 585 BC ended years of conflict between two warring peoples, the Medes and the Idaeans. The eclipse is thought to have occurred during a heated battle near the river Haliz in what would today be central Turkey. It was seen as a bad omen by combatants on both sides and it's noted it resulted in an almost immediate end to the battle and the war as the soldiers threw down their arms refusing to fight anymore. A treaty was quickly drawn up between the kings of both groups and the long war was over. What makes this particular eclipse even more fascinating is that it may have been the first solar eclipse ever accurately predicted, though its predictor had been dead for about a half century by the time it occurred. To wit, Herodotus claimed famed thinker Thales of Miletus, one of the so-called Seven Sages of Greece, predicted a solar eclipse would occur that year in the region in question. Specifically, Herodotus stated the aforementioned event on Thales' prediction, as, however, the balance had not inclined in favor of either nation, another combat took place in the course of which, just as the battle was growing warm, day was on sudden change into night. This event had been foretold by Thales, the Miletian, who forewarned the Ionians of it, fixing it for the very year in which it actually took place. 
The Medes and Lydians, when they observed the chain, ceased fighting and were alike anxious to have terms of peace agreed on. There is some debate today, however, whether Herodotus, who lived almost a century and a half after Thales, was simply mistaken about this, or it was just a lucky guess by Thales, who is thought by some, despite being one of the great thinkers in human history and ridiculously accomplished, could not have possessed the needed knowledge to predict such an event accurately. That said, it's claimed by 3rd century AD biographer Diogenes Laertius that Thales seems by some accounts to have been the first to study astronomy, the first to predict eclipses of the sun. It was this which gained for him the admiration of Xenophanes and Herodotus and the notice of Heraclitus and Democritus. For reference, Xenophanes was born only a few decades after Thales died and Heraclitus was a teenager upon Thales' death. Both lived through the eclipsing question. It isn't clear, however, how Diogenes knew the prediction of the solar eclipse is what earned Thales the admiration of Xenophanes and the notice of Heraclitus. For those in the camp that Thales really did accurately predict a solar eclipse all the way back in the 6th century BC, they note Iadius stated, Thales says that eclipses of the sun take place when the moon passes across it in direct line, since the moon is earthy in character and it seems to the eye to be laid on the disk of the sun. Meaning that, if true, Thales at least knew what caused solar eclipses. He may also have had the knowledge of Babylonian, Assyrian, and Egyptian astronomers to draw from, the former two of which had previously been able to predict certain lunar eclipses thanks to their having some knowledge of what is today called the Saros period. That said, while today this can be used to predict solar eclipses and where they'll occur, it's generally thought it could not have been used in this way with the data they had available during Thales' lifetime. Unless the Babylonians and Assyrians perhaps had more knowledge of eclipses than has survived to today, potentially allowing Thales to come up with a way to predict the year and location of the solar eclipse in question. The debate rages on. On February 11, 1831, a man called Nat Turner, who believed himself a prophet from God, observed an eclipse and, combined with recent visions he claimed to have had, interpreted it as a sign from God that it was time to rise up against those who held him in slavery. Any doubts about the eclipse having been a sign went away a few months later on August 13th when the sky was once again blackened. Turner was able to use these events to rally his fellow slaves to revolt on August 21st. Over the next two days, they killed an estimated 50 to 60 slaveholders and their families before the revolt was suppressed. In the aftermath, beyond Turner himself being hanged, somewhere between 70 and 200 slaves were killed, many of which had nothing to do with the revolt. If this all wasn't tragic enough, the burgeoning emancipation movement in the region abruptly died, including shortly after the Virginia legislature narrowly rejecting a proposal of gradual emancipation of slaves in the state. Instead, they went the other way and, noting that Turner had been relatively highly educated and extremely intelligent, made stricter slave laws, including making it illegal to teach a slave to read and write. All was not lost, however, as in the North, the abolition movement gained more support partially in response to the rebellion and subsequent added cruelty towards slaves. This all contributed to widening the divide between those who supported slavery in America and those who did not, helping to propel the young nation into civil war some three decades later. Going back to Turner's supposed signs from God, you might be wondering what caused the second blackening of the sky following the eclipse. This baffled experts of the day, but today it's thought it was caused by atmospheric ash released during an eruption of Mount St. Helens nearly 3,000 miles away in Washington state. In what is generally considered the first state-supported scientific expedition by the newly formed United States, in 1780, during the height of the American Revolutionary War, a team of Americans, led by Harvard mathematics professor Samuel Williams, were seeking to travel to Penobscot Bay in Maine to observe an anticipated solar eclipse set to occur there on October 27th. The problem was that this was in British-occupied territory. To get around the issue, Williams was able to bend the ear of none other than John Hancock, who appealed to the commander of the British forces garrisoned in Maine on his behalf. In a letter sent to the colonel in question, Hancock stated, Though we are political enemies, yet with regard to science, it is presumable we shall not dissent from the practice of all civilized people in promoting it. Colonel Campbell ultimately granted Williams' team limited access to the area requested. Most notably, they were not to set foot on the mainland, instead choosing to set up their equipment on Long Island. And so it was that after setting up five telescopes, several clocks, and other such equipment, Williams and his team eagerly awaited the event. 
Unfortunately, Williams miscalculated the eclipse's path of totality, and they only saw a partial eclipse. While it's commonly stated today that this was because Williams, a mathematician, hadn't done his math correctly, Williams himself noted it was actually simply because his map was incorrect, stating, the longitude of our place of observation agrees very well with what we had supposed in our calculations, but the latitude is near half a degree less than what the maps of that country had led us to expect. The result was that the path of totality occurred about 30 miles away from where Williams had anticipated. It all turned out okay though. Beyond a group of British astronomers who had correctly picked a location that was in the path of totality sending Williams their data, presumably with some level of smug satisfaction, Williams and his team saw enough to be able to make several scientific observations of note. This included being among the first to document that during a portion of the eclipse, the sunlight visible at the edges of the moon was broken or separated in drops. This phenomenon is caused by the sunlight shining through depressions on the moon in some places but being blocked by higher elevation points in others. About a half century later, this phenomenon would become known as Bailey's Beads when British astronomer Francis Bailey noted the same thing after observing an eclipse on May 15, 1836. Bailey also offered a correct explanation as to what caused these beads of light. They should not, however, have been called Bailey's or even Williams beads. You see, Edmund Haley, more popularly remembered today for the comet that bears his name, had not only observed them, as presumably had many before even if they hadn't documented it in a form that has survived to today, but more importantly, correctly identified the cause all the way back in 1715. Noting, about two minutes before the total immersion, the remaining part of the sun was reduced to a very fine horn, whose extremities seemed to lose their acuteness and to become round like stars, which appearance could proceed from no other cause but the inequalities of the moon's surface, there being some elevated parts therefore near the moon's southern pole, by whose interposition part of that exceedingly fine filament of light was intercepted. In the end of William's partially failed expedition, Lars D. H. Hedbor of the Journal of the American Revolution noted, It is remarkable to learn that even in the midst of the armed struggle, scientific advancement was considered by both sides important enough to take priority over the more ephemeral concerns of politics and military supremacy. Even as the course of history was being decided on the battlefields, this history of ideas and knowledge continued to unfold, only occasionally being hindered by mundane events. 